Well, good evening. Um, this is uh, Captain Aaron Bresnahan, retired, the uh, Continental Commandery Commander. Um, we're now uh, happy to have you with us for our second uh, webinar, where we have a great opportunity to be able to promote the Naval Order of the United States and also have an opportunity to interact with people that are making a huge impact for our sea services. Um, so as many of you may or may not know uh, a little bit about the Naval Order history, um, we have uh, been established since July 4th, 1890. Um, we're an organization um, that is here to preserve, promote, and celebrate and enjoy the nation's sea services, uh, especially its uh, history and heritage. Um, we also want to commemorate American Sea Service uh, heroes and important historical events. Uh, we support the study of naval history through writing, uh, through speaking, and through educational events. So this is a perfect example of where we're living up to that mission. Uh, but we also want to preserve the sea service uh, historical artifacts and we want to promote com camaraderie amongst our companions and members uh, of similar organizations. What makes uh, the Naval Order unique is that we're the oldest American hereditary exclusively naval society. Um, we're dedicated to the interest of naval history and encourage its recording and preservation. And uh, the provision for membership is based upon lineal descent, ensuring strong continuous interest in the deeds and accomplishments of our forebearers uh, in perpetuity, in perpetuity I'm sorry. And our linkage is to our predecessors that forges a common bond and is responsible uh, for the honorable service of our country. So as I mentioned today, we have a great uh, time ahead of us to have some questions and answers with our two uh, wonderful guests that we have with us. Um, so today we have Vince Patton, who was the eighth uh, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. And we also have Jason Vander Hayden, who's cur the current uh, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard and being the 13th. So we're really uh, happy to have both of you with us. And uh, we're really looking forward to what you can share with us about the Coast Guard, the history of the Master Chief uh, Petty Officer of the Coast Guard role and office, and uh, to hear a little bit more about uh, what's new and exciting uh, within the Coast Guard. So great to have you with us. Thank you, Captain. All right. Well, without further ado, uh, then maybe we could jump into uh, a few questions and just get a feel uh, for a, a few items regarding the history of the Master Chief Petty Officer. Um, but also I want you, uh, the audience to know that we do have the opportunity to take additional questions so for those that are on the call, you can see that there's an, on the side a chat room function. So as you come up with questions or things of interest, uh, just go ahead and type the question in there and then we'll try to address those as time goes on. So uh, one of the first things that I would love to hear a little bit about is, um, you know, how was the establishment of the, the Coast Guard uh, Chief Petty Officer on the 18th of May, 1920, uh, how was that pivotal pivotal to the Coast Guard history. So maybe if you if you could let us know about that, that would be wonderful. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll start off with that uh, being the old guy, uh, probably closer in age to when the creation of chiefs in the Coast Guard occurred compared to Jason. <laughs> uh, you know, for the Coast Guard, um, you know, folks often wondered, well, why didn't the Coast Guard uh, have uh, chief petty officers as well as the enlisted rank structure uh, uh, set up the same way how the Navy was done. Uh, and the answer to that was that, uh, uh, for those who know a little of the Coast Guard's history as a whole, is that uh, uh, prior to uh, 1915, uh, the revenue, you know, the Coast Guard was split up into the Revenue Cutter Service, U.S. Life Saving Service. And there was a totally different uh, rank structure, if you, if you want to call it that. The Revenue Cutter Service, which uh, attended to be the bulk of what the traditions of the Coast Guard came about when it was merged in 1915, it came about. At that time, there was some discussion about uh, besides the officer ranks, which the officer ranks for the most part were the same as the Navy officers ranks. There were some variable differences, but the officer ranks were pretty much the same. But on the enlisted side, they weren't really enlisted. They were actually just... Uh, uh, contracted civilians, so to speak, uh, under the Revenue Cutter Service and under the U.S. Life Saving Service, um, they were government employees, 
uh, but the, but the the uh, the chief person was called the keeper of of the station and so forth. So there was a discussion right around that 1915 mark when the merging of the Coast Guard uh, came about, uh, but it kind of went slow, and it wasn't until just after World War One that the discussion then kicked up in the higher gear that the rank structures, particularly on the enlisted side, needed to be common, uh, not just because of the Navy, as was the case that during World War I, the Coast Guard fought with the Navy, but more so to have that structure with responsibilities so it's more laid and ironed out. So, so it wasn't until that came into being uh, in, in 1920 that the chief petty officer rank of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard came into being. Prior to 1920, uh, there were petty officers and so forth, but but uh, there was no chief petty officer rank. And the reason for that was the fact that it would, the, the Coast Guard was still trying to figure itself out under its new layout as being called the U.S. Coast Guard. And the positions of chief petty officer was kind of variable because there was a, qu a question of, do we make a lot of warrants or, or do we make more officers or whatever the case may be. But it wasn't until 1920 that the decision was made that chief petty officers were, were, were going to come to be. So it was uh, a, a, a five-year mission to get to that point. It sounds like an incredible journey. And as you say, with all of the sort of different agencies and organizations coming together, it, it sounds like it was a, a quite a pivotal uh, time in the Coast Guard. Um, so Jason, do you have something to add as well? Uh, you know, uh, Vince is a, a, a student of history and knows knows that very well. You explained it extremely well. One thing about the Coast Guard is we have so many small units around that we uh, we need we don't have enough officers to put an officer at every unit. Uh, a lot of times in the Navy, you, you know, even the smallest units will have officers there, but in the Coast Guard, that's not the case. So uh, having a the, the chief petty officer kind of be the officer in charge at the unit. We, we have enlisted, we provide our enlisted members non-judicial punishment authority, which is we're the only service that does that. So um, the, the chiefs kind of gave the, freed up the officers to not have to be the one off at every small little unit around the, around the Coast Guard, which uh, gave the chiefs that, that added responsibility uh, and, and, you know, enabled us to, uh, save some money, if you will. Also chiefs are a little, uh, more economical in terms of salary. So it's just a, that's something unique to the Coast Guard chief petty officers. And it definitely sounds like it's, uh, made, uh, as you say, the biggest impact for the book. <laughs> so it's, it, it's a huge, uh, savings for the country, but also I'm sure it makes the mission more successful and more able to be uh, executed, so that's great. Um, I guess one other question that I would like to ask is, how has the function of the chief mess evolved over time? So it sounded like in 1915 to 1920, there was a quite a bit of planning and uh, trying to understand the role, but so how is it, how has that function uh, evolved over the last 100 years? Well, I'll start off first with it, and, and, uh, and Jason can, can bring up a little more into the now category. But, uh, you know, the term chief's mess as a whole really didn't take shape into the Coast Guard until uh, around World War II. And I think that's right about the time when there were uh, a lot more functionary chiefs uh, at a unit, particularly on board ship, uh, than they had been before. Because as, as Jason had mentioned, uh, when chief petty officers were created in 1920, and from the 1920s into the early 40s before World War II came about, uh, most units only had one chief. Uh, there may have been two at certain types of places, uh, but not a very large number. So, so there was no real chief's mess as you compared it to the Navy. World War II changed that because at that time, as the Coast Guard uh, started beefing up in numbers and the types of assignments that were given to them, uh, the more ships were created. And uh, at the stations, uh, which also had a wartime mission, uh, particularly on the coast and so forth, you started having several chiefs at a particular unit. And that's where it began to grow into uh, 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 this uh, 
fraternity, if it will, of, of where uh, people of that like type of, of uh, specialty, a uh, rating, uh, as the case may be, uh, decided that this is where we need to uh, function more collectively as a group rather than individually. Uh, uh, and I think they just kind of follow a little bit of the pattern of how the Navy chief's mess was going, as well as looking at how the wardroom uh, 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 culture was being set up. Uh, not 100% the same, uh, but, but certainly some parallels that came about to that. So it wasn't until uh, just around World War II that even in the Coast Guard's uh, uh, terminology, chief's mess actually came into being. So, uh, as of you know today, the uh, the chief's mess um, they 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 do a lot of the, the the taking care of the of the workforce, taking care of the enlisted workforce. So, um, you know, the chiefs. I, I have I don't, I don't I, my I stole this from the Navy, but it pertains. You know, the chiefs kind of run the ship so the officers can fight the ship. The chiefs make sure that the crew is trained. They're ready to perform the mission. So when we hit the go button and, you know, we, we, we set uh, the law enforcement bill or we set the GE or GQ or whatever it is that we're doing, that the crew is ready to go and they are focused on the mission. The, the chiefs are engaging the, the workforce uh, to, to, you know, talk to them about their family, make sure that they're, they're, they're full up round and ready. Uh, to perform the mission. And, uh, you know, when you make chief, you lose your first name, you kind of, and then you become everybody's chief. So you, you the mess is very helpful uh, because you might be walking uh, across the flight deck and somebody says, hey, chief, you turn around and, and you take, and they have an issue or a problem, you take, you, you handle that, you help them with it, and then you go back to the mess and you might see their chief that, you know, that division chief and say, hey, I just talked to Petty Officer so-and-so and helped them with the, with the, uh, a problem they were having. And it doesn't matter that you're not their chief because uh, we all we're all our, our responsibility is to take care of the workforce. And, and then we also um, uh, we, we, we mentor the junior officers. So, you know, when you have a, an ensign or a lieutenant JG, maybe sometimes a, a lieutenant that might be doing something new for the first time, the chiefs kind of take them under their wing, make sure that they uh, understand what the, you know, what's going on, what the challenges are, and kind of help them quickly get up to speed uh, so that they can be that division officer, or that department head that the, that the department needs. And uh, so, so that's why, the, you know, when you're all together in a mess, the mess, you know, functions as, you know, the, the sum is greater than the parts. It's uh, we're all working together to achieve a common goal, which is to to make sure that we have a ready workforce. Um, just a, a bit of a follow up question on that. Does the chief's mess um, act differently based on the mission set that the Coast Guard has? Because I know with like oil pollution prevention or life saving or um, boarding or interdictions, does, is there a difference across the mission sets or? No, I don't think so. I think that's pretty common across uh, all the mission sets. Uh, these are the units that I've been to. I mean, uh, clearly there are some units which are much more singular, like, for example, uh, the tactical law enforcement teams and so forth that, you know, because that's all they do. So it, it's that way. But but aboard ship uh, at uh, large uh, uh, bases and stations uh, where there are several chiefs, uh, uh, everybody kind of works together. Everybody has to work together because it's a small unit as a whole. And as Jason pointed out, that um, since the, since there are few officers across the board overall, and you've got the chiefs that kind of run things, run the uh, the enlisted workforce as a group, uh, uh, in a chief's mess, in order to be a very effective chief's mess, you got to know what everybody else does. And I, I think back to... Uh, 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 my my only afloat tour as a chief was uh, uh, when I was with uh, uh, Chief Yeoman on uh, on the Boutwell. Uh, in in addition to just uh, doing my role as working as a yeoman, I also had to function with what that unit's responsibility was, and that being maritime law enforcement uh, uh, support to uh, uh, naval activities and so forth. So. Uh, 
Uh, I had to know just as much or at least learn about things, uh, what was going on down the engine room, what was going on uh, in the weapons department and so forth. And that's where our chief's mess was really helpful because it gave me the opportunity to really reach out and touch with other ratings in the Coast Guard uh, to be able to understand and learn to do those particular things. So I would say as a chief, uh, you know, you really are a chief. And then whatever your specialty is beyond that is secondary to the functions as a chief and taking care of everybody. So you weren't uh, in a parochial fashion that all you handle was just people within your specific rating. Uh, because our units are not that big to be able to do that. You had to know pretty much what, well, you know, again, the, the departments and what I mentioned and so forth. And and you will be working very closely with each of those departments. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree. The the function and roles of the chief's mess are pretty universal. No matter what unit you go to, the the what the way the mess functions at each unit is is basically uh, the same, which is to like what Vince said, just you know, to take care of uh, take care of the people. Okay, great. And and as we always hear, the reason why the U.S. Uh, military is so effective is because of the senior non-commissioned officers and the the all of the gravitas that you bring, and obviously the emphasis and leadership that you have to to get things done. Um, I guess uh, next question I'd like to talk a little bit about is: um, Has the integration of the Coast Guard, uh, active reserve, auxiliary, civilians? the contractors and families, has that changed the roles of the chief? Where, when you look at all the different aspects of the stakeholders within the Coast Guard? Well, I'm gonna start off first, but I, I'm sure uh, Jason's answer is probably gonna be not just more updated, but I think a little bit more progressive than uh, uh, from the time that I would view that uh, uh, when I was on active duty, is uh, the, the key part of what we had always expected of chiefs, uh, and I'll, date this even further back to when I first became a chief in 1983, that uh, you really had to uh, embrace all levels of the Coast Guard family, and not just from the active reserve side, but we have auxiliaries, uh, we have family members, uh, uh, you know, and so forth. So, And it was very, very important because there were certain units, certain responsibilities that uh, we were involved with that you know, we involved with working with auxiliaries. We involved with working with civilians, uh, uh, with the civilian Coast Guard community as well. So uh, it was, uh, at least the time when I became a chief, it was really uh, impressed upon me that uh, I had to understand and accept uh, the entire Coast Guard community concept. So I don't think at the time when I became a chief that that was the first time they started doing it, but. I will say that it was at that time that there were some some struggles because uh, uh, many chiefs uh, felt they didn't have to do that, that that wasn't their responsibility uh, beyond uh, within their realm of their department, or their people that they had to work with. But then later it all became sort of a, you know, a, a big happy family kind of thing that everybody had to work together. Jason. So, so thank you. I, I just I'm going to go right on to that because Vince is exactly right. As uh, as the, we have as our missions have grown post 9/11, uh, and we have really had to rely on the auxiliary to do some things that maybe we didn't always have to do. You know, we, we did organically in the active duty workforce, and then we integrated. We, we, we our, our reserve component is no longer a separate component. It's never not no longer a second separate kind of arm of the Coast Guard. Our reserve units are integrated into our active duty units. So that so we are, as Vince said, one big happy family all working together to achieve the mission. And as a chief's mess, if the, if we're not if the mission's not a success, we, we have we're not a success. So having to really understand uh, how all the various components of the workforce work together to accomplish the mission, that's the chief, the chiefs have to understand that and then maximize uh, everybody's uh, talent to, to, to get the job done. So I just, I, I echo what Vince said. Uh, great answer, thanks for that. I also wanna remind everybody on the uh, webinar that if you do think of any questions, please feel free to uh, just type those into the chat box on the, uh, the right hand side of the screen. 
uh, we'd love to hear from you and have a chance to, to get those uh, burning questions answered as well. Um, all right, so uh, earlier when you were talking about the, the formation of the, the chiefs uh, 100 years ago, you mentioned there was sort of a debate between whether you wanted more warrant officers or more officers or have chiefs. Um, so I guess one follow-up question to that would be, um, have the career aspirations to pursue, uh, to become a Master Chief Petty Officer versus a warrant officer, has that uh, changed over time? How do you perceive that? Well, I, my answer is a little dated, but I, but and, I, and then of course Jason will give the you know the real answer here. But uh, I, you know, uh, for me, uh, particularly during my tenure uh, in my time in the Coast Guard and so forth, that uh, you know uh, the Chief Warrant Officers uh, uh, category um, was sort of a category to where individuals who were looking to progress as far as uh, uh, promotion to that level, uh, we're looking at where their career aspirations was, what the job entailed, and each specialty is different, uh, with some some uh, differences, particularly like bosun, for example, because there are master chief bosun mates, senior chief bosun mates, chief bosun mates doing pretty much primarily the same type of job that a chief warrant bosun would do. But in other particular ratings, there are there are big differences, particularly uh, assignments in uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, the marine safety world, which is now called uh, uh, response prevention uh, uh, type roles and so forth. So, uh, but but I but I think it became more of an individual thought at the time. Um, I have always been of the opinion, uh, you know, uh, I've always supported uh, any individual who wanted to progress through the Coast Guard if they looked at wanting to become a chief versus wanting to become a warrant. Uh, you know, I always ask them that magic question, uh, is your reason for going warrant uh, because it's more money? Or do you really understand what kinds of things that you would do as a warrant versus what kinds of things that you would do as you move up the scale beyond chief petty officer? And, and that was a challenging question to many people that, you know, they really started thinking about it. And some decided at that point that you know they were going to stay uh, in the uh, enlisted ranks versus going to warrant, and others felt to go through the warrant ranks because some because some of the avenues with, to that was is an opportunity to go from warrant officer to commissioned officer. And particularly, we have the warrant to lieutenant program, which uh, uh, a lot of uh, warrants uh, are interested in wanting to go to that. But I always challenge folks of wanting to look at further down the road of their career beyond making more money because, you know, in the, in the long run, uh, a master chief and a chief warrant officer, the, the, the monetary differences are, are, are very almost uh, near equal as opposed to looking at someone going from chief to warrant uh, and so forth. So uh, that's kind of like within my realm of life in the Coast Guard. Jason? So I, I totally agree. Uh, as, as Vince said, uh, I encourage everyone, all, all folks that are uh, advancing up to the enlisted ranks to explore both career fields, both uh, Chief Warrant Officer and uh, Senior Chief Master Chief. Um, they, the Warrant Officers are a specialty, as Vince said, and you, the Coast Guard pays you to specialize. They pay you to become a subject matter expert in a particular area, and, and then you advise and, and do what you know leverage your knowledge and your expertise and your subject matter expertise in that area and then as a chief as i mentioned earlier you're everybody's chief you're more of a a generalist you you're 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 still very sharp and and an expert in your field but you're more of a take care of a people side of the workforce so i tell people i said if you really if you're if you if your goal is to really get to be the expert, a subject matter expert in a in a specialty, perhaps warrant officer is for you. If you like taking care of people, growing people, and developing people, uh, perhaps senior chief or master chief might be more in your in, in in your world what you enjoy doing. Because at the end of the day, as Vince said, it's not about the money. If it doesn't matter how much I pay you, if you don't like coming to work, if you don't like what you do, the pay will soon be not worth it. I could pay you a lot of a lot more, and you wouldn't do it. Um, so you have to you have to like what you do. You have to enjoy, choose the path that is going to make you the happiest coming to work, because that in the end will uh, make you uh, 
better at what you do if you enjoy it. So um, I, 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 uh, I, some of my best friends are chief warrant officers. I value them a lot and they have a, 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 a definite role in the organization. And um, I, they still, once a chief, always a chief. Many of them are strong members of the chief, many chief warrant officers are strong members of the chief's mess. And uh, I think we work together well. And, and it's just a matter of what you like to do coming to work. And I don't mean to be a generalist. Many chief warrant officers are excellent at taking care of people and leading people and are very involved in what's going on in their people's lives. But that's not really what the Coast Guard pays them to do. The Coast Guard pays them to be the expert in a, in a particular area of the Coast Guard. And let me add one more thing, uh, to, uh, uh, particularly with uh, how the uh, uh, aspirations have changed over time. Uh, you know, since I retired in 2002 and uh, up to Jason's tenure at this point, uh, the aspirations, I believe, have changed greatly in terms of people wanting to be master chiefs. And why? Because uh, uh, during my tenure, I actually uh, uh, struggled with this question about looking at the career paths and so forth. And I wrote a study, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Senior Enlisted Needs Assessment. And part of the part of that study was the fact of uh, really defining slash redefining what we want our senior chiefs and master chiefs in the Coast Guard to do and be. And where I, what I was getting at was looking at the fact that uh, there was a need to create more senior enlisted roles in the, uh, in, in the command master chief type level. In other words, to grow those folks up to that point. Because up to the time when I became master chief of the Coast Guard, uh, uh, those who were uh, in this uh, command chief's path it, which was very collateral and often uh, depends on what unit that you were in. Uh, it just wasn't open to a lot of people. Since that time, uh, uh, my successors beyond that uh, have, have, have grown the position a lot more. And we have a very, very nice structured path of looking at people going up to Master Chief. And, 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 I, and I think Jason can talk a little bit more about now at his level, what he's doing, particularly with, uh, with the uh, uh, selection for Master Chief. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vince. So uh, we, we, we had of a, a lot of uh, chief warrant officers. There's 1,700 uh, chief warrant officers in the Coast Guard, and we, we have far, far fewer master chiefs. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an attractive career path to, to go uh, chief warrant officer because you had a 92% opportunity of selection for W3 and a 90% opportunity of selection for W4. And you didn't have to take a test if you were a good performer doing your job and, uh, you know, got good evaluations then you were almost a guarantee to, to get promoted. And uh, in the enlisted side, you had to take a test. You had to get performance qualifications. You had to get recommendation a recommendation. And it was, um, you know, if you didn't if you if you didn't happen to study what was on what, what questions that were on that test, it, you could be the greatest leader of all time and, and not not get not make master chief so um we have changed the process some now and and uh the commandant has agreed to allow us to have a uh, selection panel so august 11th we will convene our first master chief advancement panel and uh, we will choose our master chiefs uh, no longer from a uh, a test but from uh, performance and it'll be merit-based uh, great answer. <laughs> a lot of detail there, and uh, hopefully a lot of people were taking notes <laughs> on uh, on this career and what to do. Um, but you mentioned leadership quite a few times uh, in some of your answers, and, you know, it's often been said lately that this is the first time that we've ever had five generations, five different generations in the workforce at the same time. Do you find um, that you've had to adjust your traditional approach to leadership? when dealing with millennials or now the Gen Z or, or just dealing differently with generations? Well, for me, you know, uh, I don't know what that generation labeling was when I came in in 1972, but, but often uh, think about the, uh, the old timers, the old chiefs and senior chiefs and mass chiefs and so forth that, uh, that looked upon uh, uh, my era of people as, uh, as a group, of, of challenging people that uh, was far different than what they were. And by the time I retired in 2002, and particularly when we started labeling these generations, you know, for me, it was the, the generation X 
time frame coming in about the time before I retired was um, I saw not a challenge. What I saw was uh, a, a, an opportunity, a better opportunity of how we work with people because uh, uh, you might want to call us being more sophisticated in the way of how we manage and lead people. But I like to think of it more scholastic that uh, as time has gone on, and I think this was probably the same time when I came in, that uh, what the old timers griped about uh, people like my era was we asked too many questions. We came in with uh, with this with with this process of, of of wanting to know an awful lot and all these other kind of things instead of just do what we tell you to do and that's it. And uh, and as I see these times have gone on. Uh, I now see uh, a wonderful challenge, uh, and that's why I call it scholastic, because uh, first of all, I make the comparison that uh, folks coming into the Coast Guard today, uh, uh, more than half of them have some college, if not a college degree. When I came in in 1972, now it was a little different because it was the tail end of the Vietnam War, so you did have a lot of people with a lot of college. But then soon after that, and then when I became a recruiter in mid-70s, in 1976, uh, just about everybody... Uh, came in uh, with just a high school diploma and that was it. Uh, so the so the uh, so the educational level was very different but then it began to creep up again and again and again and now as I look back and um, you know I've had the opportunity since retirement to go visit uh, our training center in Cape May uh, uh, as recently as as last summer uh, you know I'm talking to people and companies and so forth and I you hardly see a hand, uh, uh, not go up when you say, uh, how many of you out here have college education? Uh, just about everybody has it. So uh, sophisticated, maybe. Uh, I like to say they're a lot more scholastic. And I think that's very positively challenged with knowing that we're getting uh, the best and brightest that's coming in today. I, I, I agree. Scholastic is a great way to put it, uh, Vince. Uh, you, you know, the leadership it, it, the chiefs mess is it's interesting because the chiefs you you try to standardize you you have high standards and then you try to help people achieve those high standards and you help uh help people achieve their their potential when i came in i was told you will do what the chief tells you to do how the chief tells you to do it don't ask questions and you know salute smartly and, and carry on and uh and i was okay with that I would, that was perfectly fine with me. I, I, I didn't ask questions. I made sure I understood what was required of me and then I did it. And then as I, I noticed that, um, that was, as I grew as a leader, that was not the people ask quite, you, you know, the, the, the young folks started asking questions and I'm like, Oh, I'm not used to this. They're asking questions. But then I started to appreciate the questions they were asking me because they were informed questions. They were educated, as, as, as Vince said, that they, they started coming in better educated. And so I had to acknowledge that education, acknowledge their 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 intellect, and then um, use my experience. So then you start to allow them and actually encourage them to ask questions. You have to be humble enough uh, to know that sometimes there's a better way to do something and, and a junior member might show you that better way to do it, and just the, the ability to uh, accept them, accept their feedback, accept their uh, suggestions was is a little bit different, and we've had to evolve. So I think now um, leading is more of a collaborative process with your with your subordinates than it was a directive process in the past. I also uh, think that you, you know there uh, the generation now as a leader, you almost need to. Some people need a push. So if if somebody is not you think they have higher potential than they are living up to. Maybe they're they're a little bit lazy or they're not doing everything that they could to 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 maximize their potential. You may need to push them. You see that they're not doing enough. And then some people come in and they they are doing everything they can. They're working as hard as they can and they just can't get. The, they need a pull so that they don't need. You don't have to kick them in the butt. You have to reach your hand out and pull them. And so understanding that nuance so that you can get the best out of, uh, of your people is, is super important. The post 9-11 GI Bill uh, changed our retention model. The blended retirement system is also gonna change our retention model. 
leadership, especially leadership in the chief's mess, is going to be critical to to retaining a talented workforce because they this new workforce is going to have options that that I didn't have, and I know Vince didn't have, and so. Um, um, I, uh, I, I, I'm thankful that our leaders have evolved and the Chiefs mess has evolved and to, to get the most out of their people and become a more collaborative leadership style. Uh, great answers. And, and I think you also mentioned earlier when you were talking about people wanting to come to work and feeling like they're there to uh, live up to a higher purpose or to be able to contribute to something bigger than themselves. And I I see these generations coming in now. That's you know what their purpose is and how they can contribute is a big part of what motivates them. So I'm sure the way you deal with that from a leadership perspective uh, is critical. Um, I guess uh, to transition to uh, uh, another question, um, how can the lessons of uh, the chiefs uh, or what can they derive, the, the chiefs today derive from the ch uh, traditions of the chief initiation or or the chief's uh, call to indoctrination um, to in improve or to develop chiefs of the future. This is Viz squarely in Vince's wheelhouse right here. Well, uh, okay, forgive me if this is going to be too long of an answer, and because that's uh, that's a very important question, and 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 I've got a lot of uh, corporate knowledge to that because uh, uh, the the current CCTI, the Chief's Call to Initiation, I think is what we're calling it now today. Uh, you know, was uh, uh, arrived in the in the mid '90s as a result of at the time. I was um, I was Atlantic Area Command Master Chief at the time, and we were doing our chiefs initiations uh, pretty much the same way how the Navy was doing them, and it was more uh, of a just straight line rites of passage, uh, fraternal type initiation process. And uh, my boss at the time was. Um, who was the Atlantic Area uh, Commander at the time, uh, Admiral uh, Paul Welling, uh, came into my office and uh, uh, with a draft uh, 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 all Atlantic Area message that he wanted to do away with Chief's initiations. Now, the question was, why does he I said, whoa, Admiral, what's going on here? And he says, well, you know, can you give me an answer why we do initiations? I mean, a legitimate answer why we're doing it. Not just because you made Chief in the, you know, I, I got it. But what's the value of it to the Coast Guard? What's the value of it to the taxpayers? He asked a very good question. So next stop I did was pick up the phone and call the Master Chief of the Coast Guard, who was Master Chief number six at the time, and uh, 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 Master Chief uh, uh, Jay Lloyd. And uh, he summoned uh, myself uh, and the Pacific Area Master Chief, uh, Rick Trent, who later became Master Chief number seven. It's interesting that the guys that pinned us together was uh, Master Chief number six, seven, and eight, as it turned out that way, uh, to sit down and, and work on redoing and relooking and examining why are we doing this? And is there true value in it? Admiral Welling had, you know, he really had the right thought in mind was, let's take a step back and figure out what this is all about. And we did. And what we came up with was looking at uh, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but most importantly, was taking the value of the fact when someone becomes chief, and Jason used this term about your first name changes to chief uh, when you when you when you put on uh, the anchors and so forth, is that there's a lot more that goes into this. So how do we best define uh, with tradition and with value the level of responsibility that a new chief petty officer takes? And taking that step back is looking at, well, what do we want out of our chiefs? And one of the key things, and I use this phrase an awful lot, that the chiefs are first and foremost the senior mentors of the Coast Guard. It, 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 I mean, when you say chief petty officer, the, 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 the word phrase that goes behind chief is mentor. And, and that, of course, involves with the training aspect as well as the working with people and so forth. So we, we sort of embraced ourselves around that phrase about mentoring and therefore to be an effective mentor is how much do you know about the organization and uh, what our initiation process prior to that never really got into that I mean you know we did some some fun little uh, silly things and so forth that, but uh, but nothing that really had value going back to Admiral Welling's point is that where is the value of this both to the Coast Guard and to the taxpayers 
And so as a result of that, the, uh, the final line out of this was uh, building an understanding of the organization itself. Uh, to be the senior mentor of the Coast Guard, know about the Coast Guard, know everything about the Coast Guard. You know, it's sad to say, uh, uh, from the time I graduated from boot camp up till about when I went to the Chief Petty Officers Academy in 1990, uh, I did not know the words to Semper Paratus beyond the first two lines. Uh, I did not know how to sing the whole song. I knew the tune of it, and that was about it. And I soon learned that there were a lot of people, enlisted people like myself, that didn't know it either. The officers, on the other hand, particularly those that go to the academy, that that, uh, that went to officer candidate school, they had to learn this right off the top. So we put that in there. But more than just learning the words, but learning the meaning and the understanding of it, part of learning about the organization. So uh, we did that. We built that into what the CCTI process was all about and, uh, and, and change. I mean, it was a cultural change that literally was done overnight. And it took, uh, you know, the old timers who just, well, you know, you're turning this into the kind of Coast Guard kind of thing and not really understanding it uh, to the new coming people. Is, I get it. This is this is what I want. This is this now makes me want to be a chief. And uh, and the other things that we've thrown in that program, particularly with uh, uh, the craftsmanship of building your hat box that uses the tradition of the changing of the hat uh, and, and everything else in between about learning more about the organization. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, people like Master Chief Vander Hayden, uh, who has not had the, uh, uh, you know, the, the knowledge or involvement with the, the initiation that I went through. Uh, is is to the point now, you know, they didn't even know the old system, and I'm glad they don't. It's it is so far gone at this point that all they know is how it is. I shared my uh, my uh, uh, chief's charge book with Master Chief Vander Hayden, and uh, which I'm glad I did because in the comparison to what a charge book looked today, which is which is filled with 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 uh, factual information about the history of the Coast Guard, and again taking that chief into being the senior mentor of the organization to also be the lamplighter of Coast Guard history. And that was the other part of what we did with the initiation process, to, to give it that meaning. So therefore, to answer Admiral Welling's question, what's the value in it? And what's the value to the Coast Guard? What's the value to the American taxpayer? So I obviously can't, I can't do better than that. I, I wouldn't even try. That's just, a, I love to hear Vince tell that story. Uh, so just real quick, Captain, uh, I uh, CCTI, Chief's Call to Initiation. I hope that the Chiefs develop uh, the, the acronym CCTI, Communication, Cooperation, Trust, and Inclusion. We, the Chiefs need to communicate uh, amongst each other in the mess and communicate with the wardroom up and down the chain of command. They have to cooperate. The Chiefs network is absolutely critical for the success of the of the Coast Guard and, and to take care of our people. We have to, there's a lot of trust in it amongst chiefs. They have to trust each other. And then inclusion, as Vince said, uh, I am thankful that I did not have to participate in the CCTI that Vince did. Um, and that, uh, and, and the chief's mess wasn't always the most inclusive place. In fact, it was very exclusive and you had to have thick skin and you had to be able to, to hold your own in there. I think we're trying to change that a, a little bit to where, uh, you know, uh, the chief's mess is very inclusive. Everybody feels valued and everybody's equal within the chief's mess. So CCTI, communication, cooperation, trust, and inclusion. I like great, great. Did you have another comment or? Oh, no, I, but I like no. that. I like, I like <laughs> the CCTI is, is redefined in definition. That's great. That, I, you know, I love it when a plan comes together, you know, uh, 25 years it took to get to this point. So I, I, I get goosebumps every time I hear something new that happens with the CCTI process. So. And Vince was my, so Vince has been mentoring me a long time. And uh, the, the reason we are at, at, uh, at the CCTI we have right now is, is almost solely thanks to Vince and his leaning forward and making sure that it continued on. Thank you. That's a great story. Uh, this is one of these gems that come out in these webinars that we love to, you know, to hear what happened behind the curtain uh, many years ago. 
Um, yeah, so, but if we now talk, so we've been talking about the history of the Chiefs uh, 100 year celebration this year, um, but maybe we could talk a little bit more specifically about the MCPOG and the MCPOG uh, role uh, and office. Um, one of the things, so the Chiefs, the Coast Guard Chiefs have been around for 100 years, but the MCPOG office was set up in 1969. So what kind of a difference was it when when that happened? I mean, it must have been extremely impactful. Uh, well, I'll start, you know, and I got a lot of corporate knowledge of this, uh, uh, by uh, being mentored by the first Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. Uh, uh, the, you know, when the, uh, when the senior enlisted position started, and I think I'll give you that history too, which really started in 1967, uh, among the DOD services. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, deliberately excluded itself from wanting to be a participant of having a senior enlisted uh, 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 leader because of the fact that uh, at the time, the, the culture of the Coast Guard felt they didn't need it. And in fact, the uh, by ab uh, absentia, if you really needed a Master Chief of the Coast Guard, you go to the Master Chief of the Navy. So, uh, so the the real first Master Chief of the Coast Guard was was Master Chief Dell Black, U.S. Navy, who was the first Master Chief of the Navy, and it was Dell Black that actually advocated uh, the push to have the Master Chief of the Coast Guard position. Uh, just so happens uh, he was on a flight with uh, with the Commandant of the Coast Guard uh, uh, coming back from Vietnam. Uh, they were in Vietnam visiting units, and. Uh, 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 Dale visited the Coast Guard units while he was visiting the Navy units and so forth. On the flight back, he kind of gave the Commandant a mouthful of uh, uh, miss, you know, how the Coast Guard is missing out on having a senior enlisted leader. And he convinced the Commandant to have a Master Chief of the Coast Guard position. And then as a result of that, the first Master Chief of the Coast Guard was created in, in August of 1969. And it was not met with a lot of fanfare. In fact, uh, there were more uh, master chiefs and senior chiefs and chiefs in the Coast Guard that were against having the position than there were even officers. Uh, and, and, and that was a real tough job for the first master chief of the Coast Guard because not only was he put into this new role and responsibility with a boss that felt that he had his arm twisted to, okay, let me try you out kind of thing versus uh, you know, we get you like uh, uh, with enthusiasm like the other services had, uh, but it was kind of a standoff approach in which uh, Master Chief Calhoun, our first Master Chief of the Coast Guard, uh, had a lot of work cut out to himself that followed on with the second and the third Master Chiefs of the Coast Guard that built us to where we are today. And it wasn't until about uh, toward the end of Master Chief Calhoun's tenure, which was in 1973, who championed uh, the Coast Guard uh, uniform that we now wear today uh, to give us identity and working those kinds of things to really show the importance of the position of the Master Chief of the Coast Guard. And it was more than just a wardrobe aspect of having us look different. It was it was more importantly giving us our identity and having the identity of the Coast Guard uh, of being what we are. So our multi-mission military roles and responsibilities stand out for what it is versus we're just uh, the fair-haired stepchildren that sit in the corner that are uh, called upon uh, when needed, whenever that could be. So as I've looked at through the tenures, up through the 13th Mass Chief of the Coast Guard, each and every one of us have made uh, significant contributions uh, to the service that our service itself sees the value and sees the key need of why that position exists. Uh, you know, I, I use this phrase during the time I was Mass Chief of the Coast Guard, uh, that I was a Master Chief of the Coast Guard for everybody. I was the Master Chief of the Coast Guard for a captain. I was a Master Chief uh, Petty Officer of the Coast Guard for a GS-9, and I was a Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard for a, uh, a Petty Officer Second Class. Everybody was, uh, as far as I was concerned, was in my tent. And, and therefore, because what affects one individual within that structure, regardless of whether you're officer, enlisted, civilian, auxiliary, or family member, it affected everybody in the Coast Guard as a, as a whole. And I've seen uh, uh, my successors, uh, as well as even my predecessors, have taken on those same types of uh, responsibilities and interest in the fact that you were the Master Chief of the Coast Guard for the entire Coast Guard. And what impacts the Coast Guard as a whole comes from that rank and file group of people who carry out the missions 
and make things happen as a whole. And as I see today, as I see even during my time uh, being joined at the hip with the Commandant and the Coast Guard and working through uh, uh, issues and concerns and so forth. Uh, uh, during my tenure, I, I had to deal with 9-11. Uh, with during Jason's tenure, he had to deal with the uh, government shutdown. He's dealing with the pandemic, you know. You know, but you know what? If the mass chief ain't sitting at the table, uh, you know, a lot of things aren't going to get done, or at least get done effectively and proactively as they are now. Yeah, I, I uh, everything Vince said is I echo that, and uh, as a testament to Mass Chief Calhoun's leadership and the if, and the impact that he had on the service. We have, uh, and, and also in large part, thanks to Master Chief Patton's uh, pressing in, we are going to name the 10th National Security Cutter, our flagship uh, ship of the Coast Guard uh, after uh, Charles C. Calhoun. So it'll be the, 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 the 10th National Security Cutter will be the Charles Calhoun. And I want to publicly thank Vince for, for his leadership in that effort. Oh, thank you. No, it's great to see how the, uh, the the office has evolved in the way that you can sort of make it your own, but also make it for everyone. Um, I'm going to skip. We're, we're having such a good time talking. Time is flying really quickly. So I'll try to highlight a few more quick questions. Um, how does the uh, MCPOG's office influence the way that uh, joint military service is uh, looked at? Or, or how do you impact uh, the joint fight? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off first just from during my tenure. The uh, uh, and I, I I can speak a little bit about my my predecessors and so forth that really had a, a very positive, proactive involvement with working with the other uh, service senior listed leaders. Uh, but for me, you know, one of the key things that I remember uh, uh, I got to uh, uh, in doing my congressional testimony on the on the Hill uh, before uh, uh, the Coast Guard. Uh, committees that that wh I was involved with, but I got to be invited to work with the House Armed Services Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, with my counterparts from the other services. One of the key things that we pushed uh, uh, and advocated for was the thrift savings plan that that occurred during our tenure of pushing to get that done, uh, pushing to get the uh, the pay raises the way how they were set up and before it was a straight across the board, whatever percentage it was, but we push to get them targeted. And that wouldn't happen unless the five of us were all together. We were one voice. And, and I had a blast, uh, particularly when I went to a, a House Armed Services uh, Committee. And, and, and I know in the past, my, my uh, predecessors did not get to do that, but I got to do it during my tenure, uh, that the five of us, uh, the five senior enlisted leaders, we would have these little group meetings before we went out there. And uh, and we decided we were going to talk about things that impacted all five of us versus going in to talk about the Army needs new tanks, uh, you know, the Navy needs new ships, et cetera, and so on. We went in there to talk about things that we all needed together. We all advocated for each other. And it was the coolest thing around. I, I wish I had the video to even show that, to listen to the Sergeant Major of the Army talk about the importance of tactical law enforcement teams for the Coast Guard. You know, uh, and, and for me to talk about the need for the special forces uh, and, and impact that is responsible for deployment operations and so forth. So uh, we became a force, I think, to reckon with. And even during, in retirement now, the, uh, the, the four guys that I worked with as senior enlisted leaders at the time, we're still together as a group. And, uh, and, and I know that beyond that, uh, my successors all the way up to Jason, working very close together, and then adding on uh, the senior listed uh, 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 advisory chair uh, to the chairman, uh, another big force that helps with with uh, looking at the responsibilities uh, for all of our entire military workforce. Yeah, again, I'm just going to just carry on from exactly what Vince said. The senior list advisor, the chairman. Uh, the the SEAC we call them that is that that has been a, a, a real improvement to our, all of us getting together um, and, and on just for an example last Thursday I 
I joined the rest of my colleagues, uh, the senior enlisted uh, advisors for the services. Uh, we met with General Milley on Thursday, and then on Friday again we met with Secretary Esper to talk about the, some of the things that are going on in the in the, in the military today. Um, happy to be invited to that. Uh, really, really neat opportunity. And then um, we've also now broken into the uh, joint senior enlisted. Uh, uh, billet structure. So we now have a, a Coast Guard uh, Master Chief who is the uh, senior enlisted advisor to the Combined Military Forces in Bahrain working for Fifth Fleet. So that's a, a Coast Guard Master Chief working for a British Admiral under the under the under Fifth Fleet and CENTCOM, which we've never had that before. And then uh, just this summer, um, our Coast Guard uh, Master Chief was selected to be the, the senior enlisted advisor to Joint Task Force Guantanamo Bay. And we now submit a, a Coast Guard Master Chief uh, for each of the joint uh, senior enlisted advisor positions. And we get inter we, we uh, Bill Hollinsworth was interviewed for AFRICOM. Uh, you know, Rob Bushy applied for Southcom, and we we are starting to break in. And and uh, I think as they get a little more experience with Coast Guard Master Chiefs, uh, when I say they, as DoD gets experience with Coast Guard Master Chiefs, I think they they recognize that we there's a lot of talent in the, in the Coast Guard as well. So um, we we've uh, we've been steadily progressing and coming a long way in our in our support for the Joint Force. Oh, that's great to hear. And, you know, you quite often you see the Coast Guard being employed, as you said, in CENCOM because of the law enforcement authorities that you have that you can bring to that DOD wouldn't have. And obviously down in SOUTHCOM and, and also in the homeland in the NORTHCOM AOR, there's a, a lot of uh, huge impact that your, your teams are making operationally. But it's also interesting to hear what you're doing from the policy perspective and from influencing how the joint force is shaped and developed. So, but if I could ask one last question, and maybe I'll just uh, direct this one specifically to you, uh, Master Chief Vander Hayden. How could you tell us a little bit what it's like now going through the pandemic uh, that we, you know, the lockdowns that we've had for the past uh, three months, and then all, obviously with some of the, um, I guess, uh, you know, issues related to the protests and, you know, all of the, what feels a little bit like chaos right now. Sure. Can you talk about how your office, um, how you, how you're dealing with that and, and how your position is so important uh, for the Coast Guard at this a time like this? Y yes, Captain. So, uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenge to all the services. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, as a Coast Guard, we are, a, we have 11 statutory missions and they're, and they're peacetime, you know, peacetime missions. And so those missions have to be performed. They have to be carried on. The, the uh, commerce still needs to flow. Search and rescue still needs to happen. We still need to prevent drugs from coming to our shores. And we, we need to prevent human smuggling, uh, through, uh, you know, illegal immigration. So, um, we, we, all those things have to continue to happen in this COVID environment. So we have really, uh, been trying to stay, you know, on our on our toes, uh, you know, like literally leaning forward on all our uh, all our policies, all our tech, you know, techniques, tactics, and procedures. Tracking our PPE, making sure that our crews have the the training and and they understand how to keep themselves safe in a in this COVID environment. Just for an example, uh, you, you know, one of our ships was down doing a counter narcotics patrol in the. Uh, Eastern Pacific and uh, had a bust. We, we detained some drug smugglers and it turns out all five of them were COVID positive. Yet we, uh, the crew was savvy enough and, and, and skilled enough to be able to keep themselves safe. Not one of our crew members contracted COVID-19, uh, even though they had to, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, manage the detainees. So, you know, we, we're, we're doing, we, we have to, uh, constantly be vigilant to how the missions are changing how we you know for for instance we have uh you know as we uh we we've kind of minimized our our physical presence going on a boarding so our boarding teams are doing a little bit more of a a we, we may be a smaller boarding team uh, you know we we'll, we're a little bit more careful about how we engage with the the folks that we do our law enforcement boardings on and we protect ourselves with PPE. Uh, we we have, you know, we had to 
institute a lot of virtual uh, uh, teleworking, if you will, so so that uh, we we expanded uh, our teleworking capacity exponentially. I mean, uh, orders of magnitude greater than what we had before COVID nineteen, and uh, you know, just and we've had to PCS people so. It, 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 we lose about 10% of the Coast Guard a year. So you figure of a force of 42,000, we lose about 4,200 a year. Those people have to be replaced. Their trainings, their skills have to be replaced. And we have to move people into those billets that the people leave the Coast Guard. So we've had to, we've had to continue our permanent change of station. We've had to continue our schools and our training and our basic training. It's just been a, and it's been, um, well, it's been a challenge. And uh, we've had a lot of, uh, uh, families that have have really, you know, give you know, uh, sacrificed uh, in order to be able to have their coastie, their 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 service member continue to to serve. Um, so you know, I, I acknowledge the sacrifice of all our families that have, have perhaps had to have their service member quarantine or or self isolate for a while because they happen to get exposed. And uh, so it, it's not just the service members. That are affected by this. It is the families as well, and uh, it, it, you know we are. Cre this is going to create some kind of readiness gap for us. We were not able to bring in as many people through basic training as we would like. We were not able to get as many people through their tech schools as we would like. And uh, you know, uh, you know, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Charleston, where we train all our our boarding officers and, and boarding team members, and some of our pursuit coxswain. Uh, Folks, they, they, the, the whole facility closed, so we weren't able to push those folks through. So this has been a this has been a significant challenge. And then the, the you know the the military uh, is has all in terms of the social unrest and um, our acknowledgement of uh, perhaps dis, you know a, a disparity in the way we we have uh, treated people. Uh, we you know we've. We are not immune to that, and we uh, have our areas that we need to examine ourselves, and perhaps areas of improvement. Um, and and I, you know, Vince is smarter about this than I am, but but I, I would say, um, as we sit right now, we are the commandant is uh, about to launch what we call our diversity and inclusion action plan. We are in the middle of a uh, we had contracted with Rand. Uh, well before all this social unrest, we had contracted with Rand uh, to do a uh, underrepresented minority retention study. So how can we do a better job of retaining, uh, recruiting, you know, training and, and, and retaining our, our you know, uh, underrepresented minorities in the Coast Guard? So this has been a, a focus. Our commandant has, has been, you know, when he when he took off and when our commandants took, took the position, one of the very first things he says is, "I want to make a difference. I, I don't. I. I don't want to put posters on the wall. I want to actually do things. I want tangible actions uh, that will make a difference uh, to everybody in the to make the Coast Guard a more diverse and inclusive uh, uh, place to come to place to serve." So he's uh, he's been leaning forward even before the social unrest, and I, I'm I'm proud to serve alongside of him because he his heart is 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 pure and he really truly believes in and the value of a diverse and inclusive workforce. And, and just real quick, um, what, you know, as we talk about what diversity and inclusion means, I, as, a, as sailors, as we're all sailors here, I wanna say that, you know, for me, um, diversity gives you a 360 degree view of the horizon. When you're making decisions, you wanna have, you wanna have a, a 360 degree perspective. And if you don't have a diverse workforce, you don't have that 360 degree perspective. If you had a radar and you were looking down at your radar and you didn't have, and part of your radar picture was missing, you weren't getting a return from it, you wouldn't stand for that. You would have that, you would fix that. You would do something about that. And that's, that's what diversity does for us is it gives us that 360 degree radar picture. And then inclusion, as you have your watch quarter and station built, and you're on the ship and, you're, and your DCA is filling out the watch quarter, watch quarter and station bill, you don't leave anybody off. There's no, nobody that's not, even if you're temporarily assigned to the ship, you're on the watch quarter and station bill. Everybody has a role. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And everybody feels like they have a, a job on that watch quarter and station bill. Well, that's the way inclusion is. Everybody should feel valued. They should see their, their place on that watch quarter and station bill. And if they don't, and we need to do something about that and make sure that they do. So I, that's my that that's how I I 
paint the picture of why diversity and inclusion is such, such an important aspect to the Coast Guard. And I'd like to give Vince the last word if I could, please. <laughs> well, the only thing I want to add to uh, what Jason has pointed out is, you know, he, uh, he, he's kind of employed me uh, to, to be part of this uh, uh, amazing opportunity. Uh, it, uh, in fact, earlier today, I spoke to uh, the Leadership uh, Diversity uh, Advisory Council in, at Bay Seattle, uh, and I'm going to be doing uh, a few more. Gosh, uh, the list is getting even longer. But the key part of this is, is that I want to add is that the Coast Guard is out in front of this, really, really, truly out in front of this, as what Jason had pointed out. And uh, I can't be any more prouder than uh, my Coast Guard than I am today under the challenging situations that we have faced. And I think to our advantage of being out in front is because of all the military services, uh, our service has much more direct uh, uh, exposure and impact to the American public as well as the world public for that matter, uh, than the other services have as a result of that. So it's very important, uh, very key for us to be involved and be proactive in doing these kinds of things. Sure, we got some bad actors in there and we're working on, on getting those out, but I will tell you that uh, the proactivity that uh, our commandant, our master chief of the Coast Guard has been putting involved in this is that uh, it's a, a complete, wonderful winning team that's making this work. Now, these are rock solid answers and I really appreciate your openness and uh, willingness to discuss with these issues and to really put it in the forefront. So thank you so much for those, those comments. Thank you guys for staying involved. I, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, one, so we are coming towards the end. Uh, I know we're going a little bit long, so I thank everybody for being patient with us. But uh, I'm I'm enjoying this uh, conversation so much. I'm I'm a little bit happy that we're going long. So, but thanks so much for being with us. We did have one question though from uh, Chris Harper. I guess he was recently uh, pinned uh, E7, and what he was looking for was a little bit of words of wisdom from each of you on um, you know what what he should be uh, thinking about as he's now being welcomed into the mess. So maybe as closing statements from each of you, uh, if you could maybe talk about that. Okay, I'll be- Vince, uh, Vince I would love to, for you to have the last word. <laughs> it, would, it would mean a lot if you if you would have the last word. So, uh, so, so, so Chief Harper, I would tell you that uh, what, what we need from you is to be engaged. Uh, you need to, um, you know, you utilize the mess, be a valued member of the mess, attend chief's calls. Uh, the, the strength of the Coast Guard is in the chief. Uh, there's a there's a book by a, a Navy uh, captain of a ship that says, go ask the chief. And, and that's a that's a, that's the truth. Uh, and but if you, if, if, just remember that one chief represents all chiefs. So everything you do uh, either reflects greatly on the on the chief's mess or could potentially re reflect poorly just make sure you're in the great part of that and uh and we look forward to having you and uh you know remember your energy and your enthusiasm is contagious seldom will your people bring more energy or enthusiasm to the workplace than you they look to you as a role model so be that role model for them at, like vince Patton was a role model for me and i'll just make it in three things be the example, set the pace, and follow the standards of conduct. Be the example is, is pretty much clear is the fact that first and foremost, remember, particularly even before you pin those anchors on, is that remind yourself that you live in a glass house. And as you become the chief, uh, even more so people will look up to you. Everybody will look up to, up to you regardless of rank, status, and structure. So you've got to always be the example. Don't disappoint anybody. Set the pace. It's about enthusiasm. It's about passion. It's about interest and involvement. That's what you have to do. And the things that what are important and the things that we talked about today, particularly with the crisis of what's happening today with the COVID-19, with racial unrest and so forth, you know, set the, be involved, set the pace of helping with others and gathering people along to work together and follow, follow the standards of conduct. It goes back to my first part about uh, be the example, is that you live in a glass house and rules are there for particularly for you, not only to help to enforce, 
but to also to follow and to be that particular example. Be the example, set the pace, and follow the standards of conduct. Well, great. Thank you so much. So uh, I've had a very sincere pleasure to spend the last hour with uh, Vince Patton, the eighth Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, and Jason Vander Hayden, the 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. You both uh, are a wealth of knowledge and obviously a beacon of leadership for the Coast Guard. And we certainly appreciate all that you've done and, and the service that you've given and are giving to this country. So thank you for joining us, for being part of this Naval Order uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, we certainly thank you so much for spending your time with us and and really being able to talk to um, the people of the Coast Guard and and others that are interested in in the Navy, in the sea services and what we can do uh, to support this nation. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, this uh, webinar will be available so that people can access it and share it, uh, share the link. So if you have any friends that weren't able to join, please uh, forward the link to them. Um, but again, if you're interested in the Naval Order or what we do to support the history uh, and, and the sea services generally, please also look out and try to get more information from us. So thanks everyone, have a good evening and uh, fair winds and following seas. All right, thank good you.